Thank you. Okay, uh, Marali Garima is a filmmaker from Washington, D.C. Uh, this origin informs his work and his community-centered orientation. Residue, his first feature, was a total communal endeavor made possible primarily by the effort of the people it attempts to portray. Crystal Oluqui is a PhD student, a curator uh, for the Is This Jazz Lagos Movie Club and a film critic. Her work has appeared in Sight and Sound. And again, um, longer versions of their bios are available uh, on the Film Forum website of the program page for today. Um, so yeah, we're gonna get started with this talk. Um, there's gonna be a moment where I share my screen. So hopefully um, uh, the Zoom gods are on our side. We'll see, we'll, but you know, we're gonna have fun no matter what, okay? Um, but I'll let um, Marawi and Crystal uh, take it away. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for being here. So, um, and also thank you, Janelle and the um, Los Angeles Film Forum for this invitation. I'm really excited to be here tonight uh, to talk about residue with Mary. Um, so just, uh, I thought I would start with a bit of a disclaimer. Um, though I've lived in the US uh, and in a number of places in the US, I've never been to DC. And I feel like for a movie that has such a strong sense of place, uh, it's an important thing to state. So my plan uh, is just to start with a few thoughts uh, about the movie and then have Mary jump right in. Um, I'll be asking a few questions and then we will open it to the public. So feel free to drop your questions um, slash comments in the Q&A. So Janelle, if you don't mind, um, could you play the, the opening scene of Residue? Okay, one second. <laughs> Also, I mean, while she's setting up, I can just say, you know, also thank you to Janelle, thank you to the LA Film Forum, and also thank you to Crystal, you know, um, I'm also very excited to get this underway. And it's almost better that you haven't been at DC, to be honest with you, because um, I think uh, once you go there, you know, now that you kind of miss that, you know, that golden era of the chocolate city, um, it's a, it's a you, you don't really get a true sense, you know, of, of uh, the kind of low, you know, locale, you know, and community and culture that I was really, you know, really pulling from. So it's better to watch it first and then go, so you can see, you know, so you can see the destruction for what it is, you know. All right, and with that, I'll I'll play the clip once.
Thank you, Janelle. Um, so the reason why I wanted uh, you to play that uh, opening scene is because I really want to center it uh, in this conversation because I feel like um, it almost feels like a manifesto uh, in the way it starts residue. So um, residue opens on these images of cultural demonstrations slash protest, which I believe you shot at Moechela, Mihari. And what is interesting to me um, is that in this very first shot, you see all these raised hands, some just as a cheering gesture, but also others more as a filmic one. You have many hands holding um, smartphones as there's even a DSLR. And one can see unity and long life Google placards, which anchors the scene uh, firmly into the cultural landscape of DC. So from the very beginning with this multiplicity of cameras on screen, but also the versatility of types of camera you yourself use to shoot the film. Uh, documenting and maybe even filmmaking is presented as this collective endeavor. Uh, and similarly to Gogo, it kind of invi invites a call and response structure. So I'm really struck uh, by the slow pulsating and distorted beat of the beginning as well, which gives way to the roll call song. And residue for me is perfectly captured in this beginning uh, with such a distinctive visual and sonic um, identity. What follows is a kind of collage of different fragmented angles of the protest in a magistral refusal of a certain kind of cinematic perfection or neatness. Hence the term manifesto I used um, as it's such a strong way to start the film in terms of politics and aesthetics. And of course, both are uh, entangled. So I think it positions residue in a long genealogy of black filmmakers who have sought to emancipate the image in Ben Caldwell's phrasing and the multiple overlays in the opening scene, but also in the movie more generally provide this sense of disorientation because of how quickly playful games and embraces and laughs turn into gunshot noises, fistfights, brutal arrest and bloodshedding. The people twerking on police cars at the beginning shadowed by white onlookers and myriad police agents demonstrates that constant slaying and overlay. And this is such a powerful scene because it speaks to this insane black capacity to dwell in fugitive and stolen moments of joy, to find moments of fleeting and, and ecstatic aliveness in the midst of anticipation of violence and erasure. So there is also this brief image of someone dancing, holding a street sign um, like one is holding on to life, and it speaks to, uh, I think, an alternative sense of ownership, or maybe inhabitation would be a better word here. Uh, inhabitation of the city, which is not a settler colonial claim to land, but a sense of having loved, sweat, and bled there. So many of the things I loved about uh, the movie in general, in terms of its treatment of memory, are already present in this opening with this uh, thrilling camera movement, the circular blur, the intense visual, sonic, and sensory experience in general. And um, also this juxtaposition of a really fast-paced rhythm and a slowed down time with a kind of oniric, oniric quality. So uh, both a sense of urgency and a remarkable ability to also just suspend time. Yet, I would say this opening feels uh, also paradoxical to some extent, uh, as one anticipates a narrative about erasure and loss, uh, which some of the white bodies out of frame in the opening also indicate. So on the contrary, what we get is uh, a sense of a rallying cry and a kind of massive collective and insurgent energy. It's literally people being uh, like, we're still here and we're not going anywhere. And this can feel like some cynical uh, swan song, but could also be read as an aftermath of what the movie ends with, which is rage and um, a will to fight. Ultimately, this opening feels like more of an epilogue in some way. 
So let me start with this question um, about temporality. How does one document what is at the same time disappearing? How did the fact of disappearance impact the process and temporalities of shooting that movie? And how did you toe the line between creating this archive of a community, uh, anticipating in some ways death and disappearance, but also not foretelling it in the way some of the gentrifiers are doing when they say, for instance, the old version of DC, which is this like weird claim of ownership on time and anticipation of already of an already raised uh, community. And uh, for me, this set of questions also relates to this voiceover at the beginning um, that asks, did you actually think that a script could make a difference? Uh, did you thought that film could save us? And if it's a necessary rebuttal of a kind of romanticized vision of the impact of cinema, I'm wondering, um, I think, I think it still begs the question of what do you think film um, can actually save? Yeah, I mean, first, you know, thank you for that really beautiful read of the opening, you know, of the film in general. Um, I, I think it's fantastic and I, 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 I'm just, um, I'm blown away because really in the end, you know, while I was editing it, you know, my emotional directive was just to, you know, uh, capture the feeling of being inside a go-go, you know, like capture the feeling of like, you know, the total, uh, you know, chaos, irreverence, you know, disrespectful, you know I mean, to authority, but at the same time, you know, communal, you know, like you said, loving, uh, but also potentially like, you know, violent moments between black people in the, the so specific kind of way that we do it in DC, you know? And um, I was just trying to capture a feeling, but it's like hearing you kind of talk about it, you know, I can't deny that it also, it does these things. In the end, it could be construed as a, you know, kind of tongue in cheek, you know, swan, swan's call, what is that? What that's, that's the term, right? Swan's call? Swan song. Swan song. song yeah. Song. You know, uh, and sometimes it felt like that, you know, it felt like, you know, what am I, what am I doing? You know, am I being facetious, you know, am I, am I kind of showing all these things, these beautiful imagery of DC knowing that it's too late for us, you know, that it's, that it's game over. But the truth is, you know, you know, our hashtag, for example, for the film is DC still ours because in the end I wanted it to really spark, you know, to help ignite, you know, more anger in the city about what's happening, you know, more action, more direct action about the things that are going on, you know, in direct opposition to gentrification and, you know, this total economic exploitation of black people in the city. And, uh, and to me, you know, the hashtag that came out of Mochella, which is, you know, for those who may not know, Mochella is, you know, there was a moment, you know, in which white people basically tried to stop this, um, you know, this guy who plays go-go music. He plays it very loud throughout the day. He's been there for decades. You know, he's just a staple in the community and they tried to shut him down. And the response was this massive cultural demonstration where go-go bands, the top go-go bands came out. Well, first it was just like demonstrations and protests all over the city. But then, you know, it, the, 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 you know the, the pinnacle of that moment were these several nights where the top go-go bands came and did outdoor performances, you know what I mean? And so it was like a demonstration performance kind of a situation with just thousands and thousands and thousands of people just concentrated down, you know, you know, uh, on 14th and U Street, if you know the city, you know, outside, it's like government office. Um, and uh, it was for, it was a moment in which the city really, you know, black people in the city show, you know, incredible uh, potential strength, you know what I mean? To really push back on the bullshit, you know? And, um, 
And uh, it resulted in a lot more political engagement amongst the youth and all that stuff. So that was called Mochella as a play on Coachella. But in D.C., you know, Mo, we, we, we refer to each other as Mo and all that kind of stuff. But also Don't Mute D.C. was a hashtag as well. You know, don't turn us down. Don't mute D.C. But like for me, it was important to to create a hashtag which positioned itself in a more aggressive way, you know, to say D.C. is still ours, not asking anybody for anything. You know what I mean? But just kind of reiterating the fact of, you know, kind of our ability to, you know, lay claim and our right to lay claim to the city which we have built, you know. And so in the end, it's a, it's a totally um, optimistic perspective. The whole film is not pessimistic to me, you know, at all. To me, it's my my best way of being utterly optimistic in terms of what's possible in the city. You know what I mean? What are the things that are you know, kind of holding us back? You know, or what are the things that we're dealing with? You know, as we as we battle this this larger demon. You know, I think it's striking for me that um, sound and Google in particular was this such a point of tension in that um, gentrification dynamics happening in DC. And I thought maybe you could speak a little bit um, to people who may not be as familiar with DC. Um, about why Google, um, like what Google is first and like why was it such a powerful tool of cultural protest for black people in DC, as opposed to other things people could focus on in terms of what gentrification changes or um, the kind of um, loss it brings to um, a community. You know, um... In many ways, Google Music is kind of like, you start to feel like, you know, it is the one thing that is so utterly ours, you know what I mean? It's the one thing that is just so through and through DC. Nobody else can lay claim to, to Google Music, you know? It's so uniquely characteristic of our, of our city. Um, and that breeds a very um, intense, you know, uh, sense of, um, you know, pride and, uh, you know, kind of territorial ownership, you know what I mean? Uh, but I think also is the fact that, you know, Gogo has been, <laughs> you know, increasingly criminalized, you know, in Washington, D.C. by the, the local government, you know, most likely at the behest of developers and, you know, these other forces of gentrification, you know, as part of, you know, kind of, prepping the environment for this new population. You know, the criminalization of Gogo, i.e. Black DC's culture, you know what I mean? Pushing it further and further out of the city, you know, to make DC more palatable to white people. You know, it's part of this kind of ongoing, you know, uh, battle which has been happening. And, and it's not, you know, uh, think, you know, it, it, nobody's unaware of it. You know what I mean? Everybody knows what's going on. And I think that um, that has really engendered a, a real sense of, you know, indignation in the population, you know, along with everything else that's happening. You know what I mean? Like it only takes one or two, you know, confrontations with a, with a, <laughs> with some, some, you know, white kid from who knows where, sometimes half the time younger than you trying to tell you, you know, what to do and what not to do, you know, how to live in your own city in the most entitled, condescending, you know, Pithy interactions, you know what I mean? Uh, it only takes a couple of those to really get you riled up, you know? And I think that, um, you know, kind of once Gogo was targeted, you know, so obviously, you know, specifically, um, it, it was, it, I think it was, it's, it's easy to imagine, you know, the explosion that occurred, you know, although the gentrifiers didn't know the hornet's nest that they had kicked up, but, you know, everybody's involved in the go-go -go culture, you know, in the youth and, and beyond, you know what I mean? Older people as well, it's been around forever. And, uh, and you know, these, these bands also kind of leverage mass, massive swaths of the population, you know, on their fan base, you know? Uh, everybody loves all these massive bands and all the big bands. And so, you know, it was just like, it just revealed itself through so many layers as, such an incredible weapon, you know what I mean? Such an incredible weapon against gentrification because like I said, like it uplifted all the standards of like political education, people's awareness of what's going on in the city, people's willingness to like get out there and do something 
especially like if you can dance while you're doing it. You know what I mean? Like it engenders all these things. And um, yeah, so. Yeah, that's really what's so powerful about that opening scene because like you're told, and that's actually happening. You have like a community being displaced, but you also have like this massive crowds at the beginning of people coming back and like claiming back um, the city to some extent. And um, in the movie, you have this really striking scene um, of Jay arriving, like moving back in and playing, I think, go-go music uh, from his pickup truck. And this white resident being very aggressive and being like, just turn down the music. But at the same time, um, towards the end, you have this party of gentrifiers uh, with like many white people and Jay and his girlfriend. And then here they are playing this music. They are playing Google music and um, kind of um, appropriating it. And I feel like it speaks to what happens to cultural forms when they are like so uh, violently dissociated from what was giving them mean, meaning and life. And um, that use that that use of music and of such like a, of such a black cultural form without even black people was really making me think of the title residue and this idea of what is left uh, in the process of disappearing a community. And I was wondering when this notion of residue became central for you uh, in making the movie and uh, in the telling of the story. You know, um, first, you know, it's, it's, it's exactly the same thing um, which happened to jazz music, you know what I mean? Like jazz music playing to restaurants and populate whole groups, you know, without a black person in sight, you know what I mean? Being consumed and, you know, and, um, you know, kind of, um, you know, studied and uh, uh, um, what's the word, you know, kind of hosted, you know, totally by white people, you know what I mean? Um, and it's like the, you know, kind of like the, the black soul of it has been kind of totally, you know, uh, extracted, you know, leaving, you know, kind of this exterior, you know, it makes me think of, um, you know, how when like people go hunting and they like take the skin, what's that taxidermy? And you have like these, like, you know, different heads of like, you know, shit that you conquered on the wall and shit like that. That's how I guess the feel. I was in DC one time with my you know, fiance now, and uh, we went to this, you know, gentrifying restaurant, you know, against my, you know, better instincts, and we get there, and of course, it's just a restaurant, not a black person in sight, in the middle of Northeast DC, a couple blocks from my house, blasting go-go music, you know, after, and it's like, if I left the description there without context, you know, you could see really nothing wrong with it, but like I said, on the heels of the total criminalization of, of, of go-go music in the city. You know what I'm saying? The extent, the, the great lengths to which, you know, kind of the city and, you know, gentrifiers have gone to shut go-go's down. Um, but, but because it was at a time when suddenly gentrifiers had been hit to the notion that like go-go music should be respected you know, and like held up and like, you know, it's like local DC culture. It's like cool and hip to like play go-go music, you know what I mean? To like people who would never understand or no, who don't understand it, you know, in that moment. It was just this total, mo it was this surreal feeling of just like feeling like a taxidermied head on the wall, you know what I mean? I'm just, I, I was just like, yo, this, is mu this must be how like jazz musicians feel half the time, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Having like birthed this total, you know, kind of, uh, you know, art form and just being completely taken out of it, removed from the equation totally, you know what I mean? Not even being uh, able to to reap, the, you know, the benefits, because you know they're gonna make money off of it, you know, when black people have struggled, even to this day, to really make it, make money for them. The band struggle, you know, left and right. Anyway, I hope I'm not going for tangent, but it's totally, you know, it's totally just like, people have called Residue a surreal, film or like, you know, magical realism, surrealism is like labels that I, I push back on constantly because I at no point was channeling any surreal anything, any magical realism, anything. It was totally 
me trying to put down haunted paper, what it actually feels like in, in actual natural material terms to be black in Washington, D.C. And yeah, it does border surrealism because that's what it's like. You know what I mean? That's what it feels like. But it's it's not me trying to, you know what I mean? It's not no artistic aesthetic choice at all. You know, it's, 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 it's me trying to adhere to literally how it feels, you know? Um, I'm sorry, I went off on the and I forgot the second part of your question, but yeah. Yeah, it was about the notion of residue and what you meant, like what you meant by it, but also like when did that become the central concept on which you organized um, the movie? But what you're saying also about surrealism as surrealism, sorry, <laughs> trying to pronounce that, um, is just also making me think, um, also going on a tangent there, but like, for me, it's really more about horror than surrealism. Like I, 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 I remember the first time I saw the trailer, so not the movie in itself, but the trailer, I really like, there was like some kind of like horror quality um, to the film in itself because of the slow motion, um, the kind of like reddish lights and um, the angles of vision you chose also. And even the title Residue, which was making me think about this notion of horror, but like thinking about residue more in relation to white people than to uh, black people. Um, think like in terms of whiteness and white people as this kind of contagion that descends on a city and that take everything over this kind of parasitic force. And uh, it, really, it really speaks um, in my opinion of what the state of black life uh, in the US but also around the world in general is uh, that condition, like living in a condition that borders of, on horror or is actual horror. Um, and you have this moment in the film uh, where the parents of Jay um, are talking about that to an extent um, with, uh, the, I think it's a mother who's like, I would like to move and like go somewhere else, like a place that's like less violent. And the father has this phrase, which I can't feel, but like be sympathetic to, which is like, the world is a ghetto and there's no way you're going to escape anti-blackness in Cuba or like anywhere else. And if you could speak to that notion of residue, but also to that feeling of um, anti-blackness as a kind of global condition. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, so, you know, on this, on this, the issue of residue, let me come back to that, you know, the, the thing is, I'm, I'm only recently, you know, mature enough to equate, you know, um, the fear of like growing up you know, at like the bottom of the food chain, you know, potential victim to like gun violence and, you know, police brutality and, you know, any number of things where you just imagine on a daily basis that like you could be, you know, shot down literally, you know what I mean? I, I, I you know what I mean? It's just, a, it's, it, uh, I think I've only recently equated that, you know, with anti-Black racism, you know, with worldwide anti-Black racism. And, um, you know, it's true that like, when the shit was really hitting the fan, when I was a kid in our neighborhood, and I, I for the first time was afraid to even kind of be outside. And I remember my mom, you know, really struggling to like, you know, to move us, you know what I mean? To like somewhere, you know, quote unquote safe or whatever. And my dad being like, you know, literally just like that, like you can't escape it. And um, man, you know, I can't describe to you the feeling that that like weighted me down with, you know what I mean? Just suddenly kind of, you know, this, you know, kind of like hopelessness, you know, of like, uh, you know, like damn, you know what I mean? But but I, I think that like um 
shout out to my mother because she kind of persisted, you know what I mean? Kind of eventually did kind of, you know, move us, you know what I mean? And, and you know, things kind of turned out a little bit differently. Um, and I, I think I was granted like a little bit of nuance, you know, um, as I grew up, especially in terms of like how these things kind of interact with each other, you know, and how ultimately everything can kind of be laid back down at the doorstep of like white supremacy, you know, worldwide white supremacy. Um, and like, I don't know, you know, I think ultimately that's kind of what you see playing out in the film is like, you know, it's never mentioned, you know, white supremacy or gentrification or all that. But like in the end, what you see is like these characters from all these different perspectives who are one way or another, you know, um, battling this massive, you know, kind of totally congealed, you know, kind of um, forces of oppression, you know, which have which have so many different aspects, and you know, kind of um, facades, you know, so being battled on all fronts, you know. Um, so I don't know, you know, other than to say that, like, if I can tie that into residue, is the idea of residue is like, you know, who survives that, you know, who manages to withstand that, you know, what kind of people, literally, what kind of people, you know, could, could, uh, could, uh, you know, kind of exist within such an environment, not only resist, but like thrive, you know, in the way that black people have. And it's just kind of mind blowing when you go back to, you know, the neighborhood I grew up, you know, and just see even three families left. You're just like, God damn, you know, like y'all are, y'all are hell of a, y'all are hell of a type of people, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, in a, in a kind of, you know, um, maybe, you know, two, to on the on the nose kind of idea, you know, I kind of see, you know, all these kind of, you know, let's say the police, you know, and and white supremacy at their back is like this kind of cleanup crew, you know, preparing the city, you know, what I mean, scrubbing the city clean to prepare it for this new population, but the resistant, you know, kind of, um, um, you know, that grime, that film that you just can't clean off no matter how hard you scrub, you know, what I mean that residue that persists despite all, you know, you know, all the power of the, you know, most, you know, richest nation in the history of the world, you know what I mean? And I don't know, man, you know, I have, I have a, uh, two older bros, you know, Bradford Young and Emar Hutchins, incredible artists, you know, Emar from BC and Bradford Young, you know, you know, he's a cinematographer out there doing his thing, but like they, they talk about residue a lot. And, um, it it I wasn't this clear on it when I named the film. I just kind of named it a knee jerk response. I didn't have any of this, you know, dialogue, any of what I'm telling you now to go along with it. But I I I kind of instinctively named it residue. But after the film was done, after they watched it, they kind of explained to me why they talk about you know residue so much. You know, Imar told me, man, he was like, you know, you know, black people don't really leave behind much. You know what I mean? You can't you can't you can't expect you know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, your your auntie or whoever, like, leave you behind, like, a Rolls Royce or, like, you know, a mansion or, like, whatever. You know what I mean? Maybe not even a house. You know what I mean? You might get, like, some books, some papers, some debt, you know, some um, some clothes, you know, um, a TV, maybe a couch. But, like, you know, the idea being that, like, it's not you know, what they do leave behind is not necessarily, uh, to call a legacy is too, it's too, it's too high of a term, you know what I mean? It's too, um, it doesn't, it doesn't match what they leave behind. You know, they leave behind these little trinkets here and there, but like taken as a whole, if you combine all these things and really trace the story of their life through those small things which they have left behind, you know, you really get this grand epic, um, epic uh, picture, you know, of a life lived in just absolute total resistance and struggle, you know what I mean, to uh, the most relentless beast, you know, the world has ever seen, you know, and to have done it, you know, in style, you know, and in, 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 in great fortitude and to have managed to even left one thing is a miracle, you know. So to me, it's like, 
you know, the residue of these lives, you know, that's what, that's what is more interesting to me, you know what I mean? To, to, to try and archive and, and, you know, at the end of the day, the film was an attempt to archive Q Street, you know, my community, my folks, you know, who I know, you know, uh, who I can, you know what I mean? It's in the time that, in, in the time that I could, you know, to rush to archive the community, which was effectively slated for demolition, you know, and if you go back now, nothing is there the same as it was when we shot it, you know. Sorry for going on for so long, but yeah. No, don't apologize. Um, yeah, I think like what you said about black people not living much uh, when they leave is really powerful and it speaks to the, um, to the weight of memory um, in residue or throughout. Um, I don't feel like, I don't think it would have been possible or interesting to make that movie uh, in a way where you had this like, like a strong and like very coherent narrative. And the fact that you organized everything around that question, that kind of loose question of where is Demetrius that Jay keep asking, um, I think is so powerful because it really speaks to that search for traces um, and memories um, of what's left behind. And um, just, um, the, the way you've like dealt with the memories, um, the flashbacks, the childhood flashback that Jay gets um, when he's um, like, when there's, there's, there's the scenes and like suddenly like the environment get, gets blurred out and you have these echoes from the past. Um, what's striking for me is um, how much hunting um, you have in this um, like, I feel like when I think of memory, I think of this kind of like fleeting thing. And the way you've dealt with it has given memory more of a weight than a fleeting feeling where you almost feel like Jay gets pulled back by those, um, by those thoughts, by those memories. Like you have this like very like gravitational kind of pull. And um, um, what I find remarkable is not just um, the, the visual effects you use to create that sense of memory, but also the role of sound um, in that. Uh, like, I'm just struck by how at some moments in the film, you don't even know it's a memory because of um, the visuals, but just because of um, the sound you hear, the voices you hear, uh, even if visually the scene remains remain the same. So I wanted you to speak a bit about the kind of treatments uh, you apply to voices, how you approached um, the sound of memories and sound itself as um, a kind of archival or arche archaeological material. Well, well, you know, one, I'll, I'll say, you know, if you watch any of my, my parents' films, you'll, 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 you'll immediately, I think, um, you know, kind of sound and the way that like we use sound, you know, my father, my mother, both, you know, the way it's kind of employed, you know, at the service of the story. I think it all gets tech contextualized if you, if you watch any of their projects. Um, what I'm doing effectively is nothing new, you know, but, but I will say that like, if you take, for example, Jay's circumstance, you know, he's trying to remember his childhood. He's trying to remember what things was like, but like, if you come down to like a place which looks alien to you, you know, where you grew up, but it looks alien to you looking for, you know, that porch where y'all used to play hide and seek or like that parking lot where y'all used to just ride your bikes. And it's not there, your own ability to remember these things, even to just remember, you know, when it was, how it happened is totally interrupted. I can't remember half the things. I, I question half my memories when I'm back on Q Street, wondering if I'm making them up to accommodate this new edifice, you know, to accommodate this new kind of, you know, whatever, you know, is there. Um, and so it's a real struggle, you know, to really kind of access these memories. And with just sound and image, you know, these two senses that film gives you, you know, it's, it's ultimately not enough, you know, and, and ultimately what you're saying is me just taking both as, you know, as, as far as I can stretch them, you know, with the tools that I have on hand to make up for the lack of like smell 
you know, touch, you know, taste, all these things which are involved in really transporting you to these moments where you used to, you know, man, that, that you know, the ice cream truck itself, you know, when it used to come to Q Street, I used to run upstairs, you know, go get my jar, you know, where I used to have like quarters, like two quarters, you know what I mean, saved up for some ice cream and like walk down the street jinkling these these quarters in this jar which had a little slit in it so i remember the way the metal used to kind of cut my hand because i had to cut it myself the way the jar you know like the smell the taste of the ice cream the rocket ice cream or like this mickey mouse thing with this like gum in it it's like all these things which i want to transmit which i want to archive you know but i i have no ability to so i'm i'm really just left with like you know kind of blunt tools you know and so you know, it's me just trying to do a lot with, you know, a lot more than sound can actually do for you. But I don't know, man, you know, like, as the story goes on, he, he is, um, the cracks start to, you know, the, the kind of the, um, the armor starts to crack, you know, or whatever, the, the wall starts to break down, you know, and so for me, it was, you know, I'm trying to kind of just show how his environment, his emotional state, his interactions with his friends, you know, are really just kind of disrupting, um, you know, despite the changes, his physical presence there in that space where he was born is starting to fracture, you know, the obstacles between him and his memories, you know, and unfortunately, it, there's this one moment where he received, you know, it's an actual blow that he received, which finally breaks that wall and all the memories start flooding back, you know. So that was the idea. But, you know, in the end, it's just like, you know, how do you kind of transmit my most personal kind of memories, you know, through this medium? Yeah, um, it's really striking to me that um, you have these flashbacks and memories that come back to Jay, but you also have an entire community that holds some memories of what may have happened or what has happened when he was gone. And it's really also a film about how do you renegotiate your terms of entry uh, in the community that you've left? Um, how do you get access to information without looking like a spy or someone who's out to like create harm? Um, and I think it's interesting that like there's something kind of gendered in people's relation to memory in residue in the sense that you have this sense of suspicion of most of the men um, in Jay's life, uh, this sense that is like maybe like just doing that for his movie or like has some ulterior motive um, for asking those questions and this kind of like very, to me, masculine silence and culture of silence and refusal to speak. While on the other hand, you have um, the grandmothers, the grandmothers figures who are telling us so much for the movie, either through songs or through uh, speaking to Jay and like telling him what happened, uh, the kind of traumatic events that happened to, to his friends when he was gone. Um, and I think there's something really striking about this, this relation to memory of uh, the grandmother, but also um, the, the, the black mothers, not just the grandmothers. And this relation between like this like care role and this memory role that um, the, the woman in the film kind of um, embody. And speaking about gender, um, I, I also wanted to ask you about the, the girlfriend uh, and her uh, role um, um, in Residue. Um, I'm curious about how you, like in the process of writing that character, um, why you felt it was a necessary character and what, like, what did you think she was um, bringing to that story? Um, because it feels, it feels to me that she's like so disconnected from this powerful story about attachment and kinship ties and all sorts of ties. Um, like I don't, I don't even remember a scene where Jay actually introduces her to his friends or to his family. 
And so you have this like stark contrast between someone who is trying so uh, who's trying so hard to get to get back into a community, and this girlfriend was always kind of bothering that community and um, always seen only in relation to Jay, but not in relation to um, the rest of the people. Yeah, you know, regarding the the grandmothers first, you know, I think. Um, Miss Cook, who's Delante's grandmother, who is very open about what happened in Delante's past and her own past. You know, ultimately, uh, she's doing it in a kind of um, desperate call or attempt to get help, you know, for kind of this disruption, you know, this, this thing which exists between her and her own grandson. And I think that she has the reason for it. I don't. I don't know that necessarily. You know, she's necessarily an open book. And I think that's important because, at the same time, you you're absolutely right about this kind of masculine kind of secrecy and closed off kind of nature, and suspicion. You know, kind of of other males, which is real. Um, the old heads on the stoop, you know, the old man who he goes to shut them off and Delante shuts them off. Nobody, you know, they don't want to let him into what's going on. But I think, you know, there's also these other characters like Mike and Dion, for example, who, you know, um, don't regard him in the same way or don't have the same kind of walls up. You know, uh, Mike, for example, is really only holding on to the secret in that moment, in that one moment that he has you know, kind of out of Delante's, you know, uh, you know, out of respect for Delante's request, you know, unspoken request. But I, I want to say that, like, you know, the relationship between Jay and Dion is important for that moment, you know, because Dion is at the point, you know, especially looking down, you know, you know, to his his younger, you know, younger brother kind of figure where he's able to kind of, you know, kind of transcend whatever, you know, obstacles there may be between, you know, him, you know, it's like off, well, uh, the, the kind of like wild um, thing about like prison is that suddenly sometimes, you know, I'll say sometimes you're able to be uh, more vocal, you know, and, you know, um, willing to overcome some of these backwards traditions between men and like trying to express love to like your brother who comes to visit you because you don't have opportunities to see him often, you know? Um, and I think that like, I don't know, I just think that there's nuances between the, the male characters and the, you know, their willingness or unwillingness to tell Jay about what has happened. And um, yeah, you know, I think that the community kind of has like these various responses, you know, this very, this potential for this very multifaceted response. But, but I think that um, the issue with Blue, you know, the girlfriend is ultimately, you know, kind of my attempt to render, you know, this kind of malformed, you know, ill-fated relationship. Um, which, you know, which does not, you know, take hold, you know, to present something which could be good, could, which could be fruitful for them both, which could be a nice relationship. But like, ultimately, you know, Jay's, you know, kind of uh, immaturity, you know, in regards to like, being, you know, like a man in a relationship with a woman, you know, his ability to relate with her, to like be like a um, equally participating, you know, you know, uh, uh, participant, you know, in this relationship, every chance that he has to even grow and get better at this being interrupted by the things that happen in the neighborhood around him, you know, when she's like asking him, 
you know, when she's confronting him in that, you know, kind of moment in the rain, you know, when it's raining outside, you know, uh, I think there's a moment for him to kind of reach out and like grab what she's extending in this opportunity to like grow, or, you know, whatever is interrupted by what happens outside with Tanya and like all these things. But I think that like, it's also important for me to state that like, um, in so doing, I also created, you know, kind of a half formed character as well, because Jay's not really thinking about her. You know, he's not focused on her. Almost in the same way he's not thinking about white people or the police, you know, and she's almost kind of, um, you know, subjected to the same kind of um, uh, uh, you know, undimensional, you know, characterization. And I, I, I you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm very clear on like how that happened because in the end, this is like a crystallization of my own, you know, immaturities as a, as a man in, in the process of like writing this character, you know what I mean? And the funny thing is like um, over the four years of like making the project, there were many times where I like sought to like dimensionalize her character, you know? kind of like seeing what was happening and what direction the film was going in or kind of, you know, growing and then seeing my own kind of, you know, um, you know, uh, shortcomings in the project and then trying to like <laughs> change course midway and at every turn, literally at every turn, you know, uh, it made the film worse, you know, and these were things that like I would attempt and then have to remove, you know, because, um, you know, it was forced or it was all these things, you know, which can happen in like the production of the film. And I had to allow the project to literally be a snapshot of who I was for better or for worse. And along with everything else and all the other kind of shortcomings and like imperfections in the film, you know, I'm ultimately proud of them because they do stand as of this, you know, uh, uh, exists as this snapshot, you know, which, which I, you know, is right before me to view and analyze and, and uh, to kind of grow from. Uh, but also my, you know, our ability kind of as filmmakers to allow the imperfections to seep through into the project, you know, uh, and they're, they're literally at every turn, you know, um, but yeah, that's, that's absolutely, you know, absolutely true. What you were saying. I feel like um, what's, what's beautiful also is, um, in, even if Jay is kind of unable to some extent to relate to her, is like the way you've explored um, relations between friends, uh, and in that case, uh, men. Um, and I'm thinking about that last scene, um, um, like one of the ending scenes where um, Jay is visiting John, Diane in prison and um, is always like the, 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 the landscape of the prison always gets interrupted by this uh, forest and uh, the sound of the forest itself. And you have this uh, very emotional and raw scene of both of them crying and um, holding each other also to some extent. And I just, I just want to know if like masculinity and the bonds between men was something you set out to explore or was it more of some kind of unconscious at play um, when creating a visit you? And I'm thinking about Dan, but also the relationship with Mike and um, with Delonte as well, where there is um, a lot of tension there, but a lot of unsaid uh, things as well. Yeah, you know, I can't claim to have, you know, had it written out to explore, you know, kind of like black male masculinity, like bonds between between men. But like, you know, for certain, like for me, it was like, you know, who are the people who are, you know, that I remember, you know, who are my friends growing up? What has happened to them? And like, what is the, the moments that are important to me? What have I been impacted by? You know, what is kind of like the mythology we all share, you know, between us, you know, what would it be like to see this person again? Um, you know, how would that conversation go? 
Um, and uh, yeah, you know, in the end, like that was kind of the directive, you know, it was like less thought out, you know, than a general idea of about, you know, black, you know, men, you know, kind of bonds, but kind of in the filming of it, it also, you know, created, you know, the environment for these questions to surface, despite, you know, us not asking them or not, you know, asking them or not, it was just like, you know, when you're filming scenes like the one, in, you know, with the two, you know, the Dion and Jay in the forest, it's like, the uniqueness of the images themselves strike you, you know? Like we were stuck that day we were filming in the forest. We didn't know how we were gonna do it. What's the transition from forest to prison? You know, I didn't even have it in the script. I was just kind of hoping for a miracle, you know what I mean? Um, I had it, but it was kind of contrived. You know, I was trying to explain every single thing about whatever. But literally it wasn't until we got to the forest and like me and my cinematographer was just standing there not knowing what to do, just kind of talking through it. And just the two actors, you know, Jay and, uh, I mean, OB and Jamal, just seeing these two brothers literally in the forest, just exploring nature, you know, just um, just seared itself, the image itself just seared itself kind of into my mind in that moment. It just, it just called it so much attention to itself because it's something that you never see. You know what I mean? It's something that you never see. You know, this curiosity, this wonder, is that all this kind of stuff of black, you know, two kind of grown men, you know what I mean? And um, so, you know, kind of the image presented is, it came to us with its own weight, you know, it called attention to itself, you know, it really kind of told us where to put the camera and how to shoot the scene, you know, and like these larger themes of black male masculinity, they, they, they kind of illuminated themselves, you know, in that way, you know, um, uh, as we went, you know what I mean? They presented themselves as we went, despite what we thought we were doing or not, you know, they kind of came and they became threads that we started to follow, you know, like this is beautiful, you know what I mean? How do we really kind of, you know, uh, work with what the film was presenting us, you know? And it was like this process of discovery, you know, discovering images, which, which I yearn for, though I have rarely seen them. You know, but like, um, which suddenly, like, I, I want to continue to create, you know what I mean? Like, it's just the film, creating the film is, a, is really, we called it a mirror, you know what I mean? Production itself, you know, is a mirror. It just kind of, you know, presents you to yourself in the most beautiful way, just, just by going, you know, one step after another. It, can, it just presents more and more about you to your own self, you know? And though I never thought out, you know, in the terms that you put them, that I wanted to explore this thing, you know, it just so happened that I actually did, you know what I mean? And um, and that's what we ended up doing, you know, and I don't know, you know, I hope that explains it, but you know, it's really a, um, it's an unconscious, it was an unconscious process for us, certainly. Thank you, Mary, um, for that answer and, um for this really beautiful discussion uh, in general. So we're going to start taking questions um, from the audience. Um, and Janelle is going to join us as well. Yes, um, I'll help with that. Well, before we, before we get started on that, just kind of to the last point, Marawi, I think you actually might be selling yourself a bit short. I think a lot of from my memory, what appears in that scene. I think you actually did have it written out in the script, you know, and maybe this is from kind of my, maybe the lens I'm adopting, which of course in our many discussions is, you know, surfaces gender a lot. I feel like, I feel like a unique sort of um, love between straight black men, which isn't surfaced in a lot, like it's not something, it's still something that I think within our community, <laughs> I think maybe we don't have the vocabulary too, but I think it was there pretty early. So I do, I do wanna say that from my perspective and that's something that i found admirable about the many iterations of what has become residue. So I'm gonna just say that. Um, and, but to questions, 
um, from anonymous attendee. Um, Jay is in exile from DC working as a filmmaker in California. You are a filmmaker grounded in your origin and upbringing in DC and yet working across the country. What is the price to our community when we leave? Damn, how you know I was in LA? <laughs> it's like, nah, I'm um, playing. Yeah, um, it's interesting. You know, it's hard to say for sure. You know, I mean, at a certain point, you gotta maybe wonder, you know, what the filmmaker's intentions were in the first place in the process of making the film. You know, in many ways, you know, we see films like this, you know, made by kind of young black folks. Um, really just like with the intention of, you know, uh, you know, being that platform or that catapult to send them to Hollywood, you know, to LA. Um, and, you know, that was kind of a fear of mine early on, you know, you know, just like making the film, you know, blowing through like a whirlwind, you know, taking what we need, making a project and then kind of never being seen again. <clears throat> So I don't know, you know, I'm trying to do, I'm trying to position myself. I'm trying to craft a life in which I can keep that from happening. Um, because I think that it, it, it does, it, 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 there's a great cost, you know, which is paid because the community itself has done so much work to generate you, you know, the storyteller, you know, which is supposed to be you know, the one who's able to play that role within the community. If we think about all the roles which have to be filled by the community members themselves, you know, it takes a lot to sprout a filmmaker. You know, it takes a lot of watering and ingredients and sunshine and care and love and all this protection, all these kinds of things, you know, for a community to, to birth, a, you know, and, and, and cultivate a filmmaker, you know, who can serve the interests, you know, of that community. You know, and it's, you know, symbiotically, you know, serving their own interests. And uh, for, you know, filmmakers or, you know, whoever, you know, who has been, you know, anybody sprouted by the community who leaves for one reason or another, you know, it comes at, it does come at great cost. You know, you, you end up nurturing another community rather than the one that birthed you. And I think it's, you know, this is a conundrum that, uh, you know, all Black communities face, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it's like, uh, it's difficult, you know, especially in a society which, you know, lives totally on the, you know, the, um, you know, kind of economic, you know, extraction, exploitation, ex extractive exploitation of like, you know, black communities, you know, for its, you know, so-called best and brightest to like go to another place. And in fact, join the machine and extracting, you know, from these black communities from which they came, it's, you know, it's a great question. So all I can say is that, yeah, there's, there's incredible cost and the cost is, you know, things kind of remain the same as we see them today. But I, you know, I do believe that like the way forward for black creatives is, you know, is, you know, really um, collective action, you know, in a way that tries to, you know, decolonize the process, you know what I mean? Kind of, really put our power back into the hands of the community, you know, the power of authorship back into the hands of the community. So I don't know, you know, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm not clear on it myself, you know, but I know that like, there's incredible work that has to be done literally at this stage where I'm at now, as I'm taking my first steps into the industry, you know, having created my first project, having been accepted now by the industry, you know what I mean, cleared to go in. You know, what, you know, what will I do? You know, how will it turn out? You know, <laughs> who knows? You know what I mean? Like, you may never see me again. But, uh, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know. You know, we'll see. And I, I think it's important, you know, not only for me, but for all Black creators to be really self-conscious about literally this, this exact question. There is uh, a really beautiful question uh, by Biniam. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing it, um, which is when talking about Blue's character development, you spoke about some of the things that was reflecting personally and who you were. In that sense, what is the thought process relating to casting, casting yourself as Demetrius? It's almost as if you, Mary, through the character of Jay, are going back and forth looking for yourself in that place and time 
and being unable to find it. Also relating to the idea of memory and the distortion of it you talked about, or was it just logistics? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I absolutely love this because, you know, it, it was just logistics, but in the end, it doesn't matter what it was. In the end, that's the film, you know? In the end, that decision was made to, to, to make the film as it is now, you know? When we shot, you know, the couple shots, you know, if you look at, um, the, you know, the few shots of me in the film, one is like, we were just rapping on like the last day of shooting. We saw some like cool fog coming out, you know, the sewage system you know, some steam. And I had Mark shooting in slow motion just to have it. You know, half the shit, half the things in the film you saw was just us shooting, not knowing how we would use it, but, you know, thinking we would want it to have it just in case. And so he was filming this, this theme, which is coming out. It's looking cool, but like, there's nobody, everybody has already gone home. So there's nobody to put in the steam. So I just kind of walked through it myself, you know, as he was shooting just to have it. And then the other shot is actually, I, it looks like my mouth is moving and saying, what up? But actually, it's like a shot in reverse of me directing them in between two other shots. And it was like something that I found. And so once I got the idea in my head that we can use, you know, this this guy, you know, as Demetrius, then kind of because Demetrius was never intended to be shown. You know, the other shot was me bringing the bicycle in the, the basement and the blue lighting and closing the door behind me. You know, that was just a dream with some random person. A, you know, dream sequence, you know, with it wasn't supposed to be Demetrius. But anyway, the decision to, to actually show Demetrius enabled me to string all these random shots together to give an impression of Demetrius, you know, and what Jay thinks he might look like if he were to see him again. Um, it just all worked out like that in a really cool and interesting way. But my point is, it doesn't matter how it happened, you know, in the end. Is me playing Demetrius, and and so, and and yes, in the end, it, I am, you know, kind of stuck in this warp. You know, I'm stuck in this loop. You know, looking for these people, looking for this neighborhood, looking for my childhood. You know, endlessly. Although, you know, funny enough, like not. Why well, I, I won't say. It. Sorry, I said too much. I don't want to ruin anything for anybody. <laughs> uh, we have. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, a question from Ijike. Um, How much did your limitation shape the story we see on screen? Which came first, the calling to tell the story or the meanings behind the title residue? The... Um, yeah, the, the, the need to tell the story came before literally anything else, you know, like I went home one summer, I saw the damage, you know, and it was like, all right, I need to, I need to kind of you know, write a film, you know, make a movie about this, not knowing what the story would be, nothing. It, I was just kind of working on a feeling of just total anger and, you know, kind of indignation. And it was that, you know, first foray it was that first decision to like tell the story that allowed kind of all these other things to like come forward, you know, these pre-cooked or these, these ideas which have been marinating my whole life, allowed them to kind of step forward, you know, to the forefront of my mind. So initially it was just a story, uh, gentrification sucks, you know, I'm about to, I don't know, it was like super vengeful, you know, petty, but it was a film no less, you know, something for me to kind of sink my teeth into. And um, and then uh, the story of one of my best friends, who I, you know, one of my one of my best friends growing up, who many years ago I had learned, you know, kind of had went missing, you know, and just kind of like which even before I even got into film, in the early two thousands, this is something I was thinking about, you know this guy who had went missing, like what has happened to him and how could our lives really take two different turns? Um, that presented itself, you know, really as like the core, you know, of the story, you know? And so I guess once these two ideas combined, you know, um, we kind of kicked it off, but yeah, the story and the need to tell the story, you know, to like 
actually it was also, you know, because of the changes, it was like, we also need to get these people on camera. We need to get this community on camera, you know? So like, there was like these directives, which came before the resources, which came before, you know, knowing even how we would do it, you know, all of that. All I knew was that my dad, who, you know, my parents, like I said, they're filmmakers. All I knew is that, you know, my dad had shot, you know, two feature films before he graduated from, you know, from film school. So I just knew it was possible in some way or fashion. And that's all I needed. So we just kind of went forward from there. Well, speaking to that, the actual first part of that question was how much did your limitation shape the story we see on screen, which I think is in dialogue. Yeah, I mean, you know, whatever you think the budget might be, you know, it's less than that, you know what I mean? We really had no money, you know? And, and I think that like, we, um, you know, it was a total economic limitation in terms of what we were kind of able to do. And so everything that made it to the screen was something that we snuck one way or another, you know, uh, and um, found some, you know, cool, creative, elegant solution for, you know what I mean? And, and I think that it, it like I said, like my, our, you know, imperfections, I, I list that amongst our imperfections, you know, quote unquote imperfections, you know, it's just like our inability to like, you know, we didn't have money for cars and like guns for like this drive-by sequence, but like the drive-by sequence is there in audio because we, you know, had to figure it out by sound design. Um, but because I didn't have money to show the car and the guns and all that stuff, it actually forced me to remember the moment in which, you know, I was trying to access in which I couldn't even see the car or the guns anyway. You know, I was stuck inside the, you know, my, my mother's car surrounded by my siblings. So I, all I could hear was what was going on anyway. And so to me, it was an excuse to, you know, generate an even more honest rendition, you know, honest to my own experience of what had happened. And it happened countless times, you know what I mean? Uh, where we didn't have the money to kind of go Hollywood with it or whatever. And so we're therefore forced to kind of um, do it more honestly, you know, to like stick to like how I actually remember it or, you know, try and like dig deeper. I feel like it also just enables you to attain deeper truths in some ways, because I feel it's so important for the story that we don't see the face of that policeman, that we only hear the voice, because it's also about how it's about, a, it's about like, even if it sounds like a black voice, like how it's about an entire system um, of oppression and not like this particular individual cop. So I think there's something happening in that kind of depersonalization. That's You really know, cool. yeah, but like, What's even more powerful to me is the fact that like the material obstacle, the material condition came first, you know, the material inability, you know, we didn't have enough white actors. We could not, you know, attract white actors for the life, you know, for the life of me. I could not get them to come to set, you know what I mean? Even if they had shown interest. And so we only had one or two white people. And so we had to reuse white people so we couldn't show, show their faces anyway. You know what I mean? I had to shoot one white guy's arm. But the economic uh, obstacle came first. And then the political power revealed itself to us in that moment. It was like, yo, this is actually an amazing opportunity. The film is gifting us an amazing opportunity, you know, that we can either take or leave, you know, to not show white people at all, you know, to, show their, to not show their faces, to not show police officers to not show anybody to focus squarely on who Jay is focused on. Those who have survived, the black people he knows, the people who cares about the story that he's trying to tell. You know what I mean? White people have so much power in the city. We, you know, there's, there's very little we can do you know, for gentrification, but like within the frame, we hold all the power in the world. But like before all that incredible thought process and ideology came, first it was the fact that like we didn't have enough white people to show in the first place, even if we wanted to, you know what I mean? That's what I just, I just love about it. You know, it's just kind of being open and willing to like see what this limitation has presented to you. You know what I mean? What may come out of this, you know what I mean? And to see every limitation as actually a gift in disguise, you know? That's what I mean when I just, I said, I just love the imperfections because it was, it's actually evidence of us at our best, you know, as storytellers, you know what I mean? Just on our feet in the moment 
you know, crafting the story on the fly, literally on the fly, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah, I just love it. Um, we have a question from Ronnie. Although the film is set in Washington, D.C. and so specific to your experience, I feel like there was an attempt to keep the location general and universal. This can happen anywhere, and it is. Was this a conscious decision? No, no. For me, you know, we, we tried to make it as specific as possible, you know, and if it wasn't more specific, it comes again to like, you know, my lack of you know, experience or creativity or our economics, not knowing how to make it more specific than it was, but like specificity was our, in authenticity and specificity were really our driving, you know, kind of mandate, you know, was to make a film that like DC people first and foremost, you know, could like watch and know where they are, where the characters are, literally what they're saying, even in the thickest moments of their accents, you know what I mean? To know that that plays or to know what type of person this person is because they recognize it or the music and like literally every decision was how to make it as DC as possible, as specific. And not only as DC as possible, like as Northeast DC, Eckington, you know what I mean? As we possibly could. And, you know, it wasn't perfectly, you know, I, there are things now looking back, I would do differently to even be more so that, but like, no, at no point do we try to generalize or, or you know, whatever. And maybe to extend, you know, to that point, which is, you know, it's a topic of conversation often, you know, in terms of specificity versus universality and like all that kind of stuff. But like, in the end, I think it's, maybe it's a consensus now, you know, I'm hearing it more and more, but something that we talked about a lot in film school, you know, Janelle and everybody else, you know. But I think uh, ultimately, you know, films that play at universality, you know, that try to make everything universal and, you know, general and all that kind of stuff. Ultimately, you know, um, they they become like, I don't know, too abstract, too, too general, you know what I mean? Too universal, whatever. And it's really the films that like, in my opinion, the films and the stories that drive at total specificity that really kind of achieve, you know, any any semblance of universality, if there's some to be, you know, had in that, in that, in that, in that kind of realm, you know, in that, you know, in that story itself. So. I think it kind of builds on and that. So I think. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jan. No, you go. You go. It's all you. No, I just feel like uh, it's kind of a follow up to that question of location. Um, versus general and universal, uh, still Rani um, is asking about working with people in your neighborhood and uh, especially working with uh, non-professional actors or a mix of professional and non-professional actors. Yeah, you know, um, like I said, it was it was kind of an excuse to like put pull a whole community into a film, you know, like I said, to archive and document this, you know, the fact of our existence, you know what I mean? So it was like, my neighbors are in there, you know, they're, the kids are like, you know, kids from Q Street, you know, the children of like my friends, you know, playing, you know, like my, my friend's child is the young boy who plays young Jay, you know what I mean? So he's like acting in a film about his parents' gener you know, generation which I just think is like the most like beautiful, you know, kind of thing, you know, which resulted from the fact that we, we wanted as much as we could to, to draw from the community, to cast within the community, you know, have the crew, you know, from the community or to teach people from the community who may not know about film, about things so that, that, so that they could participate in the crew, you know, to shoot the locations from the community, you know, um, you know, we were fed and like housed literally within the community, you know, and, we just tried to make it, you know, really as about the community as possible. So the non-actors was a natural kind of outcropping of that. One is it's a natural thing to like low budget filmmaking, you know what I mean? Um, you know, uh, but but it's also like a, you know, my, my, once again, my parents, you know, come into play. I've never, I've only seen them work with non-actors and performances you know, that you know, my father's able to kind of bring out of, of non-actors. It's always, you know. It's always, it always works for the story, you know what I mean? To say the least. 
Um, so yeah, you know, many of the, you know, two, two of the main actors, you know, have acting experience, one of them in film, the other one a little bit in theater, you know, or a good amount of theater and uh, maybe a short film, but like, it's never been anything that has been, you know, seemed daunting to me, you know what I mean? But like I said, because authenticity was like the primary thing, it was more so about casting a personality, which kind of achieved or kind of, you know, contained, contained or felt like a crystallization of like DC, you know, accent, you know, uh, style, personality, temperament, you know. So yeah, everybody in there who's from DC, you know, in the character is from DC in the, in the casting, you know. Um, that was more important than acting experience to me. You know, so like Delonte, played by Dennis Lindsay, was my roommate in college, you know. But like he's DC through and through, you know, and like, capturing the accent, which is music to my ears, was more important than, you know, I, I, I've heard, I've heard, you know, Hollywood or, you know, big name actors try to do like a DC accent and it never bodes well, you know, I, I wasn't even going to try it. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, so we're running at the end, but just to kind of um, piggyback on that question and I think um, kind of gesture to the larger communalism of the film. Um, maybe if you can just end by um, uh, talking about your, the, 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 the choice of how you, um, of your credits, the movies and credits. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, so if, if you see the credits, you'll see, you know, it's kind of like this old school style of like showing the actor by their name, and you know, that's part of it. Uh, and that was important because, you know, um, those, those, you know, the actors who I did that for, you know, may have shown an interest in acting or may have, you know, kind of shown interest in like, you know, pursuing the craft or, you know, kind of thing. So it was important for me to like, show their faces, reiterate, this is the person who played this, you know, non-actors, you know, but still let me get their faces out there as much as I could. So that, that felt, that felt right, you know, for me. But, but before I even get to that, I'll say that like the process of like making the credits was subjected to, you know, the same kind of critical approach of every other aspect of the film, which ultimately is just like, you know, why, you know, why, why am I using, you know, what are these credits for? And like, why would I do them, you know, you know, according to how they've always been done before? Is there a way that I can do it? And, you know, that kind of serves me better, you know, or serves us better. And so like, one of my issues with credits in general is that, you know, it's got like, written by, you get your own title card, directed by, you get your own title card, produced by, you get your own title card, and everybody else kind of gets this scrolling kind of crawl. And it's super hierarchical, you know, it's super, you know, a lot of ego caught up in it. A lot of people have it, you know, built into their contracts, you know, how the credit should run, you know what I mean? They get a full page by themselves or there's no deal kind of shit. Which, you know, if it works for you, it works for you. If that's your thing, that's your thing. And I understand also the importance of like, sometimes protecting your name and, you know, how often people can be erased out of the process and there's money attached, you know, to like these credit decisions, you know, in the big leagues at least. But for me, you know, here in this project, this kind of like modest, small film, you know, where we had the ability to do it how we wanted to, it was kind of important for me to disrupt, at the very least, the hierarchical kind of nature, you know, of the whole thing. And so you'll see the credits, you know, my name's not first, it's jumbled up, it's randomized, you know, so that everybody kind of just has equal time to be in the credits, you know what I mean, as they kind of scroll outside of like the first couple actors with the images, you know? So it just felt right. And I, I made sure like, you know, my cinematographer and other folks like, y'all cool with this and like, everybody was on board, you know, because it's also an attempt to resist, you know, kind of this, um, this, this habit or this process of Hollywood and cherry picking individuals from a film, you know, to accept. And our goal has always been to kind of like lock arms, you know, kind of rise up together if it is up to, to rise to or, you know, to kind of go through this process together to not really allow, you know, oneself to be cherry picked, you know, 
and everybody else to kind of be discarded. So that was also an attempt to kind of throw off the, you know, the radar, or, you know, the, the whatever, you know what I mean? To really kind of randomize it and just show us all this equals, you know, in the process. Um, well, that's it, y'all. I told you we would have fun. That was a phenomenal conversation. And just to double down on how good it was, I'm going to reread <laughs> some quotes because Crystal yeah. really started us off. And I was like, screw this. I have to write no, this down. So, so hold on. We're going to end with this really quickly. <laughs> and I quote, and apologies if I, you know, I was writing this and typing it. Um, but regarding Black cultural forms, Crystal said early in our conversation, you know, that they can be violently disassociated from what gave them meaning in the first place. Um, and then, exactly how the question and phrasing came out. But with regards to um, an anonymous question we had earlier, Crystal's um, kind of also reframing the question with how do you renegotiate times of entry into a community every time after you have left? Um, and a really good, and also a really good question about what Crystal called a masculine si silence, a cultural silence, a refusal to speak, um, which, you know, I'm gonna say two things and bring it together. Um, you know, something that Adam <laughs> suggested that I kind of gestured to is the fact that, yeah, this is kind of in many ways a narrative film. Los Angeles Film Forum doesn't necessarily, obviously doesn't screen narrative work. That's kind of the point of the organization, but something with this question in this part of the conversation and with, you know, of course, something that Marawi gestured too many times, recontextualize this film in a kind of math and silence of cultural silence it re does really kind of remind me of Haile Grima's Ashes and Embers. And it does really remind me of Shurikiana Aina's um, larger documentary practice um, being his parents. And so I think that lineage in this kind of package of this really great question that Crystal posed was amazing. And I'll give Marawi a quote. I'll give you a quote that I reread too. I love how you said ultimately economic limitations, you know, were, were the primary reason for a lot of things, but then the political power revealed itself. And later on within the frame, basically within the frame, we hold all the power in the world. So I feel really enriched and <laughs> I know <laughs> y'all do too. Um, so, you know, I want to thank everyone uh, that spent that spent about an hour and a half with us. I want to thank um, um, uh, Crystal for her um, rigorous but soulful um, framing um, and yes. conversation and questioning. Um, yes. and I want to what thank a reading. Marali and the larger Reza crew larger Reza crew, some of who are uh, present on, on in this uh, event uh, for uh, all the work you had in, um, in this film. So thank you, Marawi, for coming and for all your answers. Um, uh, for, and again, um, further information, you can go back to the LA Film Forum site, which is linked in the chat for program notes um, for this program, as well as further information about Film Forum. If you're new uh, to following the organization, please check us out. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Adam, did I get everything? Got everything? Okay. It looks, it looks like I did. Okay, great. Okay. Again, uh, thank you all. Um, and thank you to and, Janelle and, for organizing yes. Yeah. Thank you, Janelle, for yeah. making it happen. Thank you everyone for attending. And we look forward to bringing you lots more great conversations and programs in the new year. Happy holidays. Thank you. Happy winter solstice. Be safe, everyone.